Welcome everyone to the next episode of the first season of the FIP Chief Executive Officer interviews. Today I have the honour to welcome Rupa Dat, Executive Director and Co-Founder of the Women in Global Health to the interview chair. Thank you so much Rupa for making time for us in your busy agenda, especially during these strange COVID-19 times we're living in. My goodness me. I wanted to welcome you to our first season of the FIP CEO interviews because you seem to epitomize everything we are after. We're running 10 such interviews in this season with global leaders and colleagues in pharmacy and healthcare. And we today will seek to explore your journey, your experiences and the impact those experiences have had on your professional practice. So Rupa, I was inspired to start these discussions after the FIP president, Dominique Jordan and myself, were having a discussion with Professor Trevor Jones, an eminent pharmacist and pharmaceutical scientist, around the development of a vaccine and treatments for COVID-19, something very dear to all of our hearts at the moment. Trevor walked us through how his experiences with AZT in the 90s and 80s had gone and how invaluable those lessons had been for now. But the thing was, he wasn't just open about what had gone well, he had talked us through what hadn't gone to plan. And this is what really, really helped me reflect on how important it is for our global leaders to be able to share such insights, to be able to share our experiences when things don't go quite to plan and what we can learn from them. So Rupa, today I'm so proud to interview you in this first season, and I can't wait to share some of those insights with our profession and maybe some life lessons for me as well. We aim to take about 30 minutes, but Rupa, Welcome, before I start the interview. Hello, how are you today? Hi, Catherine, I'm really great. And um, it's just uh, so exciting to be with, be with all of you and uh, have this conversation. Wonderful. Let's get straight to it then, Rupa. So I note from all of my research around you and also from having met you on several occasions now, you are a passionate advocate for gender equality in global health and you are a leading voice in the movement to correct the gender imbalance in global health leadership. I also know you are practicing internal medicine physician and are particularly committed to addressing issues of power, privilege and intersectionality that keep many women from global health leadership roles and to opening up spaces for the voice, voices of those women to be heard. I note that you started the movement to transform women's leadership in opportunities in health by co-founding Women in Global Health in 2015, some five years ago. And since that time, it has more than 25,000 supporters across more than 90 countries, and it continues to grow. Um, we will come on to that in a lot more detail, but Rupa, I'm keen to focus on the start. Let's start at the very beginning. Can you tell us a little bit about Rupa as a child and your inspira inspirations for choosing your career and where those came from? Uh, yes, Catherine. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> me as a child. Let's see. I think my mother would characterize me as a troublemaker, um, but I would say that uh, I was always set on really, uh, you know, whatever goal that I had, I had to accomplish it. So I think ever since a child, I was always very determined. And um, my background is I grew up um, uh, both in the United States and partially in India. I was born um, in the northern part of India in a region called Punjab, which is very conservative. And when I was five years old, my parents um, immigrated to the United States. And I grew up between both countries for the first um, 10 years and it really shaped my understanding of the world and what it really showed me is that one, um, I really see myself as uh, a global citizen. So that's merely uh, for me to imagine that, uh, you know, we have borders and uh, it only matters what's happening within one set of uh, borders really makes no sense because for me, as much of my family and friends um, were in India as in, in the US and the most um, 
formative years. And so I think that that was one key part of my childhood is just really looking at the world as um, one, one common place that uh, regardless of the borders that exist, we are all um, people living in, in the same, same planet. Uh, and then secondly, I was always just really, um, you know, determined and um, I felt that there was a, a reason um, for me to constantly, you know, um, you know, ask a lot of questions, be investigative. Uh, sort of the, sci the scientific uh, method was something that really allured me. So I was always up to little experiments, whether it was at home or in the backyard. Or, and uh, my my mother never really quite grasped like why was I and my grandmother why why was I so into you know constantly trying to get to the bottom of things and you know until I got the answer I just you know wouldn't wouldn't give up. And so I think a lot of that sort of determination um, really came also from my childhood of seeing my parents face a lot of ad, ad, um, adver, ad, uh, adversities as being immigrants that didn't have much money but had to really um, carve a pathway for themselves, especially in a time period where um, while they were educated, had they both had higher education university degrees, um, moving to the United States, those degrees were not considered uh, valuable since they were degrees from India. And so my parents, the first set of jobs that they held for many years were um, what we call in the, in the US blue collar jobs. And so, uh, but they never let go of their, you know, skill set knowledge, training, their vision for a better life for my brother and I, and they were very determined. And I think I always saw that and it played out in my childhood years and just the way that I kept that same spirit and, um, and it's been very, very formative. And, um, and I'd say in addition to um, those other things in my childhood, I'd say the other part of me was I was always very adventurous and my mother has um, shared with me that there have been many times that um, I've gotten lost at a fair or wandered off. So I've always been a little bit of the explorer. And this is before the t popular TV show, um, Dora the Explorer came to be. But uh, if there's any character that I'd pick from my childhood, it probably would be Dora the Explorer. Because uh, I always had a very, um, a, I was always very curious about my environment and, um, and always looking for the next opportunity. Rupa, that's fascinating. I see so much of that in the in the woman you are now. Um, that's amazing, isn't it? Uh, and you're you're striving and your fight for equality and recognition and parity uh, across genders is also, I think, very grounded in seeing uh, what we would all know is is just um, how would I put it? It's it's like it's an unjustness, it's an injustice in our societies when people who come into our countries aren't recognized for the skill sets they have. We will come on to that because I think this will really fuel us in your experiences. Um, Rupert, it's time for you to sit back for a second while I showcase uh, a few of your uh, best bits, as we would call it. There's a, da a dance show in, in the UK that um, when somebody's leaving the dance show, they say, let's have a look at your best bits. It would take me the entire interview to detail your achievements, but there are a few that are really important. Uh, we've mentioned your commitment to addressing issues of power, and you've given us a, a mini insight into where that has come from. The Women in Global Health flagship uh, Heroines of Health event provides a platform from women from diverse backgrounds to share their stories and to advance their leadership. I'd like you to tell us something about that in a little while. Um, but you're the executive director of um, this hub and your global team works with a network of chapters in every region to challenge power and privilege for gender equity in health um, by mobilizing a diverse group of emerging women as health leaders. And that I think is really important. As co-chair of this gender equity hub, and the Global Health Workforce Network, Women in Global Health, published, delivered by women, led by men, uh, which is absolutely um, seismic in its impact. And this looked collectively for the first time at issues of leadership, decent work, free from all forms of discrimination, harassment, including sexual harassment, the gender pay gap and occupational segregation. And you were recognized in the Gender Equality Top 100 the most influential people in global policy 2019. Two things are amazing about that. Number one, congratulations on being recognized, but seriously, the, 
it was 2019 when this publication was published. We'll touch on that in a second as well, Rupa. Um, you are a regular speaker at global health events and you've published widely, including in The Lancet, and you serve on several advisory bodies advancing gender equality and health, uh, which we will lead. The thing is, Rupa, um, I mentioned at the beginning of these interviews that many lessons we learn along the way don't just come from our successes. So my first big testing question for you would be, what would you consider to be the three biggest lessons of your career to date? I think, thank you, Catherine, for, for those highlights. I'd say the, um, it's hard to pick three because there's lessons constantly. I feel like I wake up every day and I'm like, you know, let me reflect on what I learned you know, from the day before. And that's really how I, I um, it's the sort of, just the way that I look at the world is, you know, we have a learning opportunity for our time here on earth. So every day we really should be, you know, taking uh, as opportunities to learn things and um, really reflect and see, you know, what lessons can we gain. But if I had to pick what are my top three, uh, one um, that really has uh, something I've come to embrace, especially through women in global health is just how much leadership matters and how leadership comes in many different forms. And that repertoire representation is really important. I, for a very long time, um, especially in my early years, uh, was very comfortable with being sort of behind the scenes, um, not necessarily uh, being someone that would embrace that you know, most visible top senior leadership role. And, um, and I think a lot of it had to do with just um, insecurities, insecurities that were created um, from gender influence, from sociocultural norms, from um, just those uh, intersections of identity growing growing up as an immigrant in the United States. And so I, I really struggled with, um, you know, taking the full person I am and, and embracing all the forms of leadership. But through my journey, especially in women in global health and meeting women from all generations, from all different backgrounds and realizing how um, embracing leadership in all the different forms is something that women from all backgrounds really have struggled with. Um, in that journey of recognizing that, I've been able to also unpack my own insecurities and um, really embrace the different forms of leadership and understand that leadership really matters, that political power really matters, and that women, um, to be able to really shape um, the global agenda or to shape even our personal lives, um, we need to have power and, um, and we need to be able to exercise that power and be enabled to use that power. And for me, that is all forms of leadership that currently are imbalanced in the world. And um, so I'd say the first lesson is really recognizing that um, leadership comes in many forms and it really matters. And it's something that we need to learn how to embrace and, um, and also see that it is um, transformative in, in so many different ways. So I'd say that um, for the, the work that I do, that's probably the number one thing. Uh, and, uh, and keeping in mind that when we do have diversity in leadership, it really makes a difference in, in almost anything out there. Like I, I advocate a lot for diversity based on gender, by diversity based on race, ethnicity, um, other backgrounds. Um, they're so critical to our field of health. Uh, I've seen it play in and out in clinical settings. I'm sure many of um, the pharmacists know exactly um, what it feels like uh, to not be uh, you know, included in the decision-making um, part of the clinical care, but I have seen what difference it makes when we're in multidisciplinary teams, when the nurses, social care workers, pharmacists, um, medical students, uh, trainees are all part of the same team providing clinical care. When there are people of um, ethnic minorities part of the team or uh, when we're trying to serve underserved communities and we have members that are from those backgrounds part of our care team, we're able to design um, solutions based on a deeper understanding that wouldn't be possible otherwise. So I'd really just say that that's probably the most proven um, proven part of it, um, but it's still not easy to advocate for those things. And, and uh, 
I assume that just evidence would be enough to convince people of uh, diversity and leadership really matters and it's not. And so I think that's where it really goes back to this lesson of power really matters and um, uh, working toward getting to those influential leadership roles is really needed to, um, to shape the agenda. And then I'd say the second lesson is, which is very linked, is um, the power of collective action. Um, I really believe in working in um, teams and groups and networks and partnerships. So a lot of the examples, um, Catherine, that you pulled out, especially the Gender Equity Hub um, and things that uh, I was involved in my, in my student days were always part of being in large um, networks and, and together we were able to have a lot more impact together. And uh, I, I know sometimes it can feel um, really tough to bring everybody you know, to the same um, table and then uh, get everybody to be on the same page and, uh, and have this shared vision and sort of you know, uh, carve out that um, common pathway together. But when all of that is done. Um, I truly believe in that, you know, African proverb that you go much further when you are with a tribe versus a lone leader. And, uh, and there's truly a power of collective action and I've seen it play in and out in so many different settings. And of course it's not easy. Um, and there are even sub tribes that are formed in larger networks and you have to navigate that and, um, and negotiate a lot and bring people together and uh, build a lot of trust. But in the long run, that's really where, especially for social change, um, you know, there is a critical need for collective action. And uh, third, third lesson I'd say is that um, I've heard a lot of no's and rejections in my life. Uh, and I, I struggled a lot to talk about them because they always felt like such failures, especially during my very early years as a teenager and in my 20s. I almost felt, well, you know, you only really get to see everybody's accomplishments or you know, people, especially in today's uh, day and age where everything is on social media, we only really get to see the best of the best. Rarely are we getting to see um, uh, the low points, the failures, the struggles, the rejections. Um, there is, uh, there are some people out there that are starting to share some of those things, which is great. And I hope more and more of that happens. But um, especially in my, um, uh, early years, I really struggled with uh, with getting that no or getting that rejection, and um, and I would get quite upset and angry at myself, and and you know a lot of self blame of like why was I not getting these opportunities? And I think what's happened over time, especially as I've um, had deeper relationships with people that have um, had longer. Um, career pathways than I have, and uh, they've shared with me how often that they've faced failures and um, have had rejections and, and people that you would just not imagine would have ever failed at anything. I think it's really helped me, you know, embrace um, failures as opportunities to learn. And what I've learned to do is through, through that is um, that there are always opportunities out there. And if you focus on following the opportunities and if there are rejections or failures or setbacks or sometimes uh, feeling like it's not possible, there's always a way if you are very determined um, to create opportunities themselves. So like Women in Global Health is a classic example of that. We um, were uh, not uh, funded in any way when we started. We were driven by a shared vision of seeing gender equality and global health leadership. And a group of us early career women um, came together, uh, really nudged by the generation before us to put forward the solutions for gender equality. And uh, it really took us connecting online. We didn't all know each other quite well. And a few months later, we went to the World Health Assembly um, with a very strong vision for gender equality, but not the big uh, bankroll uh, pocket of, you know, grants and all this funding. We just really were very driven and had a shared vision. And we decided to create a movement and ask all of our friends and colleagues, you know, can you, you know, chip in with your influence and um, can you give us your time and your 
uh, perspectives on being part of the movement. And that's how we started in 2015, was really at a coffee table at the World Health Assembly um, in the Pele in, in Geneva. And now looking five years later, we have, as you said, so many supporters and followers around the world in many different countries. And that was an opportunity that we had to create um, since it wasn't possible in the current um, setup of global architecture. Thank you so much, Rupa. I think all of those really interlink, don't they? There's the leadership matters, don't take it for granted. And even if you don't feel empowered to be a leader every day or at all, we all need to see someone in some way like ourselves in leadership positions to know it's possible. And that's really important. So then for me, that alongside your other point, your third point, around following opportunities means I think for those of us in positions of perhaps relative privilege who get offered opportunities it's actually important that we do take them because then we provide pathways and route maps for those who may not necessarily be as privileged to be able to see it and I, I think um, just a bit of feedback Rupert I think one of the things I see and hear from uh, the Women in Global Health Network is that the vision that you created wasn't limited or small. It was big enough to encompass all of those people who have wanted to get involved. So a real testament to you and all the colleagues and your tribe who started this, because I think you really mobilized something in many of us. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, yeah, you're really speaking to me. I can see this. Um, thank you, Rupa. Thanks, Catherine. <clears throat> For us, it was, we, we decided we really couldn't wait for others to fix the system. It was really for us to fix it. And I think that was um, really the spirit that brought the co-founders together. But what really I think was touching was how many more people out there um, felt the same and were just looking for that platform and how many more people are like now inspired by saying, yes, I, you know, I, I've always felt this, but didn't quite, quite know that gender inequity was a driver of why I was feeling the way I was feeling in this space. And, um, and I think it's really transformed even how men think about it since, uh, many times and men, uh, you know, or work with women, but they don't necessarily realize that women were facing such large setbacks and not getting those leadership opportunities. So I think it's definitely been um, a, a something that's in a way been catalytic for everybody involved. Yeah, it brings us together, doesn't it? Because it's a shared aim. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, Rupa, let's, I'll move us along. Um, the, all of these questions are very linked. So some of the things that I think we will will cross over absolutely no problem at all. Um, we wouldn't have time either to go through all of the external advisory expert leadership roles you've held. Um, I know that you're a practicing primary care physician. Uh, you completed your medical training in the Department of Internal Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. You served as president of the International Federation of Medical Students Association and were a founder even in those early days, in the early days of Dora the Explorer as a professional of the Young Voices Youth Pre-World Health Assembly, um, which is such an achievement. Um, also, you have this portfolio that I see really works for you, a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of Science, a Master's of Public Affairs um, from Sciences Po, Paris and France, and a medical degree from Temple University School of Medicine. I mentioned earlier on about, you know, how um, esteemed you are and you said you work in teams um, in order to get there, but you also serve on several advisory bodies. Um, so you are highly recognized as a, as a leader, President Council of Pathfinder International, Strategic Advisory Committee for the Global Health Workforce Network, Globe Med Advisory Board, formerly on the Research and Gender Ethics Advisory Board, Global Health 5050 Advisory Council, Global Health Council Advisory Council, and Women's Leader in Global Health Conference Steering Committee. Um, and you've led global campaigns and delivered and engaged people <laughs> from more than 120 countries. So if you're feeling a little bit tired or exhausted, Rupa, there you go. That's possibly why. <laughs> but you know, I've read out a load of stuff there, and we know that CVs really are a collection of 
um, items that create a story about ourselves that we're in control of. But on a personal level, Rupa, what are your three biggest achievements to date? Uh, so, Catherine, I'd say for the very first one is uh, really during my student leadership days, and I'm so connected still to young people and youth and uh, anyone that knows anything about me. I always create space to engage with young people. It's been, uh, for me, uh, really having those opportunities as a youth here um, in the United States, but then growing up and um, getting opportunities to be part of this international federation of medical student associations was life-changing. Uh, it's very personal. I met my partner, uh, my husband in that federation too. So he's, he's Austrian and I was, would have never imagined I would marry somebody from Europe, uh, let alone, um, you know, from some di such different uh, cultural backgrounds, but it was really that federation that uh, shaped and um, challenged my, my mindset. Um, uh, and I'm, you know, so lucky for what that organization gave me, not only exposure to global health, but also really what it means to embrace cultural understanding across borders um, in a different way than how I was exposed growing up in California, which is a very diverse state in, in the United States. And I'd say my biggest achievement is really um, being able to still cultivate student leadership. So I was able to do that as a student leader, but now that I am um, in, in an organization organization with um, multiple platforms, as you've mentioned, Catherine, all those different advisory boards and all of that. I see them as opportunities as how can I continue to um, car carve out opportunities for the next generation and for women, especially women from underrepresented backgrounds. And so um, cultivating student leadership is probably my like number one most rewarding achievement and it still continues to give uh, for the first time uh, the Federation had their virtual General Assembly and I had the privilege to be invited to speak at um, one of their uh, keynote sessions and um, I learned much more through them uh, and it's been something that I continue to um, uh, be a part of and one of the programs which um, I'm the most um, you know, I think biggest achievements is the pre-World Health Assembly for young people. When I joined um, the Federation, I really felt that, you know, young people should have an opportunity to be on the global platform and shape the global health agenda. Um, there were so many conversations about um, youth, adolescent health, young people, um, and I got exposed through uh, to global health through um, uh, engaging with WHO and UNICEF as a youth delegate. And in this advocacy effort, um, what I realized, and many of us um, students also felt the same, was that we really needed to be, have deeper, meaningful youth engagement. And so we launched this pre-World Health Assembly um, in partnership at that time with the Graduate Institute. Uh, and it, it was a program that brought together 40 young people from around the world. Again, not with a lot of resources, but um, a lot of spirit and we put together a four to five day program of both um, soft skills, so learning how to negotiate, uh, learning a bit about diplomacy, and learning about the key topics that would be presented at the World Health Assembly. And those 40 people would then go on um, to have a active advocacy at the World Health Assembly. And uh, what's really exciting is that that program continues to happen every year. And it was always my dream that the director general would attend these. Um, and during the year we started it, we were a bit dismissed as, oh, you know, or we're not important but what's great is that now um, it, this program is one recognized by WHO and they have very senior leadership including the director general um, of the World Health Organization have uh, recognition of, of the activities that the young people are doing through IFMSA. So I'd say that that really feels great to know that um, I was able to create something pass it on and it continues to grow and thrive and achieve much more than I could ever imagine uh, when I started it. So it's, that's, that's probably, I think, one of the greatest um, achievements. Uh, and then the, the second achievement I'd like to say is one that um, is a very recent one and I hope everybody that's tuning in is really aware of this. Um, last year, uh, we passed a at the high level meeting for universal health coverage, a political declaration on universal health coverage. And one of the really um, critical pieces that 
in the initial um, drafts of this document uh, that was missing was around um, gender equality and the rights of girls and women. And so what was really exciting is that Women in Global Health um, brought together uh, um, two other co-convener organizations and then eventually 110 um, NGOs from all around the world to form an alliance called the Alliance for um, UHC and gender equality um, to really advocate to make sure that gender equality was um, cross-cutting and present in the declaration. And what was really exciting is that through um, all the different um, ways that we uh, mobilize through writing uh, letters, having uh, bilateral meetings with governments, through um, uh, doing active advocacy in New York um, and in Geneva, we really were able able to um, help shape one of the most, if not the most, strongest um, uh, health uh, declaration out there on gender equality. And so that's something that um, um, when we first started advocating for, I was really not sure if we would get all, that, all the language we wanted because times for our gender equality and sexually reproductive health and rights are really challenging. There's an active rollback. There's an active defunding that's coming from the United States government, but also many other governments are falling to pressure, um, whether it's through external pressure or national pressures. And so for us, when we started that uphill battle um, in the beginning of the year, uh, we really weren't sure whether um, there would be a decoration that would be reflective of the values that we felt were critical for health in, in the 21st century. And so I think that was just really amazing to, to finally see the decoration. And uh, there was a time period, Catherine, I'm not sure if you've seen me uh, carrying it around, but I was carrying that you know document <laughs> around a copy of it. And um, the first, um, as you said, I've had the privilege to, uh, <laughs> to give a lot of different talks. I would literally pull out this exact you know, <laughs> set of papers and be like, I want everybody to know about this document and know that the gender equality is in there, but also that it recognized 70% of the health workforce are women um, and that we, we deserve decent work conditions. And so it was just really, really exciting. And to know that I was part of that um, and that Women in Global Health was part of that, I think was just um, something that... Uh, I know I, I, I've stopped carrying the document now. The, pa pa uh, the papers finally started crumpling a bit, but, um, but I, inside I just feel the spirit of just, again, collective action at work um, in, in that side. Uh, and, I, I, and then trying to think about what else would I say is the proudest achievement. Um, it's uh, still something uh, that I feel is not, reaches maximum potential and that's women in global health. Uh, when we started it in 20, 2015, it really was meant to be a campaign of building awareness and the fact that there is a gender gap in global health leadership and um, to have a vision for achieving that equality. Uh, and what the movement has transformed into is that it's really become a, um, a growing platform, um, especially for women from um, Global South to get visibility and shape the health agenda. And we are now, um, we have 23 chapters and um, 20 chapters around uh, in uh, 20 different countries with 40% of them in lower middle income countries. And I feel like we're just, again, at the tip of the iceberg, the demand is really high from women all around the world wanting to participate in the movement. So I see this as like a work in progress. And I really hope that all of those that are tuning in uh, join a Women in Global chapter, help create one. Um, all genders are welcome to contribute and, uh, and be part of the movement. So I see this as something where uh, I'm already amazed by what it's been able to do, but I still feel there's a lot more that the movement can continue to do as it grows. Well, I think so, Rupa, and, and no doubt you'll be watching it grow for decades to come. I think that's the thing, isn't it, that you start something up and then you realize it's not what you need, it's what the women in global health need, and not just women, but what men need their women in global health to be achieving as well and how we can support it. Um, oh, thank you so much for taking us through that. But those students observations are so powerful and impactful and I was just uh, reflecting as you were saying um, I think that you need to in roles of leadership always keep true to the youth in your profession or the youth in our societies because 
they really are the future. And they bring lots of opportunities, as you say, you know, Austrian husband. Who'd, who'd, have, who'd have thought it then, Philippa? <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually caused you a lot of, a lot of opportunity and uh, change in your life, being part of that federation. Um, I'm, I'm so, I remember you holding up that declaration. I just want to say there's something very tangible, isn't there, about um, having a document that others have helped craft and it really helps you showcase that it's not you on your own achieving something on a platform but that you can bring those people with you if you showcase that document so i really understand the physicality of a document it's um wonderful to hear really wonderful you should be super proud of those yeah. achievements um, and mm. and Catherine, i was gonna say it's also just um the rights that we have and um i i feel like once things are you know why i came into policy was I realized pretty early on there's just only so much I could do at bedside and as much as I love clinical medicine and the, and the physician patient relationship not a, not necessarily an easy one but a really rewarding one um, what I what drew me to policy and really to be part of um, organizations like IFMSA and creating women in global health and uh, and why I have so much respect for FIP and other similar um, larger associations is that there is really um, power in policy and transforming um, what existing uh, rights are. And so I think that uh, why that particular document meant so much that um, high level political decoration um, on, on UHC is just not only the vision that no one should um, end up going into financial hardship and accessing health, but that we were able to make sure that gender was also factored into it. And, um, and, that we don't continue to operate in this sort of siloed way of thinking or being um, gender blind or, you know, blinded by all the other different identities. So I think there's just so much power in policy and, um, <laughs> and it's great to be with partners that believe in that. Well, it is. And I think it's um, tantamount for organizations like FIP to overtly support policy. Uh, we've just actually signed a declaration with the International Association of Adolescent Health um, endorsing the uh, role around um, helping adolescents and young people maintain and access good sexual health advice wherever they are. And um, your point, Rupa, right at the beginning about leadership matters, the power of transformative leadership. You have to see someone like you, whether it's organizationally or personally, um, to be able to step into those roles yourself. And it's okay for us to have the rights, isn't it, by where uh, we've been born and by nature of our parents striving for us, but we have to create opportunities for those that come behind us. Very important. Goodness me. You're so wise, so wise. Um, I think this next question, Rupa, is very linked. Um, but one thing is the difference between things you can be proud of that aren't necessarily your achievements, but might be things that you've been part of. Um, so we've separated them out a little bit, but um, can you walk me through the three things you're most proud of? And they can be personal or, or yeah, they can still be achievements, but you know, it offers us a little different conversation. Yes, I'd say that um, this is really tough. I really had a hard time with this question, to be honest with you, Catherine. Proud, being proud is a, something that, that doesn't come, uh, come that, that naturally yeah, to me because yeah. I still feel like there's so much work to be done. And, and, and I don't mean to just give that answer to, to, to be a cough out answer, but what I would say is um, what I feel really good about uh, myself deeply in my, my spirit is um, the fact that I've been able to stray um, true to my values. And, um, and that's not easy to do. It really, really isn't. I think there's always um, a temptation in different ways um, to, you know, one, one example is like, uh, I am in an organization where we advocate for challenging power and privilege for gender equity. Um, and it would be a lot easier uh, many times to look the other way when our partners um, might not have diversity in, um, in activities that they do, right? Because, you know, who wants to call out a partner that you're trying to collaborate with um, and, and likely has many more resources, has many more 
um, has been around longer and you know you just don't want to strain a relationship you're trying to cultivate uh, but one of the things that we have to do and it, it, it's often my job as being the ed is having that difficult conversation and saying hey you know i notice you're putting out this activity or you're organizing this event and um it's an all male panel or actually it's a conversation with um all 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 white people like we are talking about global health like global health 80 percent of the world's population is based in lmic so it's people of different backgrounds and how can you have these you know non-diverse conversations and um and what i can say is that um, even as tempting as it might be to um, take the easy pathway um, i've been able to stay true to the values and and, and when I am, let's say, not doing that, I ask my team to challenge me and remind me. So it's also um, practicing um, a, a lot of what we are preaching in Women in Global Health about holding each other to account. So I'm constantly in a learning phase myself. And I think that's also part of the values I have is um, not only just advocating for those principles, but asking those around me, friends, colleagues, family, um, partners, uh, just please, you know, make sure you hold me to account. Um, and I think that that takes, um, uh, it takes a lot of uh, willingness to be not always in uh, a position of comfort. So I, I think that that's something I'm incredibly proud of and it's not easy. And I lose sleep often over these difficult conversations. I even ended up getting a personal coach uh, through a scholarship <laughs> that helps me learn how to manage some of this because it's not easy to um, you know, stick to some of the things that you're the most determined to. And I'd say the other part that I'm um, also also very proud of it is just uh, being committed to uh, being a lifelong learner. I uh, used to be a phrase I used in essays, <laughs> personal statements, but now uh, when I really look at and when you were reciting uh, or pulling things from my uh, accomplishments, I realized that, you know, it might seem like a lot of degrees or a lot of roles and responsibilities um, that someone has taken on, but for me, I still feel like that there's so much more that I want to learn about that, that I, I hope that I'm not just limited to what's been done. And so I think I'm very committed to this um, learning process, both through formal opportunities, but even more so through informal opportunities. And, um, and I'm really glad that I still have that spirit. So Rupa, I think this really, there's a golden thread running through all that you're telling us about yourself. Um, from the door of the explorer we saw at the beginning all the way through to the qualifications I listed where you're a magpie you're picking up things as you go and isn't it just wonderful that we're not completely defined when we get to a certain stage even if we've had a CV as full as yours that you're still seeking to think what's next and where next and how can I develop and how can I grow and that's really nurturing rather than limiting so i think that definitely is something that i've heard very loud and clear through this conversation uh, which is just wonderful to hear from one of our great global leaders um yes yeah, really good and and all of this when we when we listen when uh, we have um people listening into this i think you really have reflected on your early career your early experiences and how they've given you the power of collective action and how some of those no's that you may have had then gave you the skill set to build on how you can stay true to your values. So the whole story really links with the next chapter you're telling us about, which is really delightful, really lovely. Um, and at the beginning, uh, Rupa, I told you that it's not all about all the successes and all the shiny achievements and all of the medals and all of the, the things that look really amazing. Um, in terms of attainment. It's the story along the way and you've, you've been second to none in telling us that. But um, if you were to give three top tips to the next generation coming up behind you, which I think is something you're really thinking about day by day with your constant interest in youth work, what would those three top tips be to the next generation, either in medicine or in pharmacy or just in global health? Yeah, I would say the first thing is be visionary and really look for what inspires you and um, what what is something that you could be passionate about. And so, and think about 
really the, there's a slogan from um, the SDGs, creating the world that we want. And it really uh, stuck with me during my student days. And um, it's still something I go back to when I'm talking to young people. Really, you know, create the world um, that you want and is so critical for, for the next generation. And so I'd say be visionary. The second part is uh, really learn how to work um, together. As I mentioned, so much of what I've been able to do has been with um, a tribe or a team or uh, a, 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 some network or partnerships or alliances. And so uh, really encourage uh, uh, everyone that is really looking to um, work on any issue to really work um, collectively and, and work together. And the third part, which is, uh, I think, probably the most challenging when when you're um, especially in the early stages of uh, wanting to bring social change is staying committed some of the things that have been working on have taken years and some things I'm working on I know will take decades and I hope they're especially the goal of gender equality is pre we the predictions are it's going to take at least a century so I really hope to change that and make it decades and uh, achieve that collectively with others in my lifetime but knowing that um, that especially for causes that are worth it it is um, critical to stay committed as well. So I'd really say be visionary, work together with other like-minded people and um, stay committed to, to the vision you wanna achieve. Again, such great advice. And I think if you is something that you believe in, it does give you that longevity, doesn't it? To stay committed. Um, and then you just need people around you who you can trust. Uh, if you're gonna have to do this for a long time, then it has to be with people that you like along the way. Um, Rupa, definitely. Oh my goodness. Yes. I've learned a lot today. Thank you so much. So Rupa, um, just we've, we've got uh, your top tips to the next generation, but I just wanted to gain a little more insight into your tips and trips, um, Rupa, that we've all had to change habits and ways of working in recent times. Um, COVID-19 definitely has shown us the best of ourselves and perhaps the worst, but what would you say are the three essentials in your working life, especially during COVID-19, Rupa? Yeah, I'd say the, f the first is, uh, we often talk about resilience is really needed in crisis. And I think resilience is also in the leadership style that we um, all exhibit. And so for me, that's been really making sure that I integrate a sense of humor <laughs> into everything we do and give time for my team and myself to step back and just be people. Um, so I think that's really needed even in a time of crisis such as um, this pandemic has shown us and challenged us, especially in the first couple months, it was really tough to um, draw those boundaries and say that, you know, these are the work hours. Um, so I'd say, you know, one really to have um, a way of building and resilience in your leadership style and for your team um, is really critical. And in my case, I've used having a sense of humor and just um, really encouraging uh, my team members to also um, bring personal stories into um, how we connect with each other virtually every week so that we are always seen as people first and the work next. Uh, so I'd say that that's been really critical. Um, the other things that I've been doing um, to just keep my work-life um, balance is just really communicating a lot more with people about um, uh, the fact of needing more time to, to get things done. It's been, uh, there's been this sense of urgency that really was created, especially I wanna say March, April, and May. It felt like everything was like urgent, urgent, and there were, you know, every day was becoming 14 to 16 hour days. And, uh, and at some point I just realized my mind was not functioning anymore. And I still feel like there's a bit of mental fog in COVID-19 that I hope goes away. Um, but what I've been able to do is just draw a little bit more boundaries and have longer timelines. And, um, and some of those skill sets we've learned in about time management, I practice that a lot more both reminding myself what are my top priorities for the day but also asking my team to do the same what are the top priorities and let's stay focused on that and the rest will um, you know will get done or it'll be or it'll get for forgotten about because it didn't really matter and that's okay um, and then the, the third part of what's really helped me through all of this is um, again I can't keep echoing the importance of this but just 
really having a team and team support. Um, I invest a lot of time into um, connecting with my team members um, and just having both check-in calls and how they're doing, but um, also uh, really making sure that we are um, coming around um, together on the fact that we're working on really critical issues. And at the same time, it's important to take care of ourselves to then be able to work on those critical issues. And COVID-19 has particularly for gender inequity, um, really given us an opportunity to break out of the echo chamber. So we feel this urgency, unlike ever before in the last five years, to just be there on in every conversation. But what um, what I've really been trying to do is just ground the team and and have us ground each other so that we know that we are really in a marathon and not this sprint and that every day doesn't have to be this you know ridiculous sprint of 16 hours. So I'd say, yeah, definitely, uh, making it through COVID-19 is um, finding a sense of humor, finding other ways that you can build resilience into your day-to-day um, and uh, keeping um, in mind that, you know, we're working on issues that matter. So I'm very inspired still, but working with a team makes all the difference. Well, I think, you know, again, the this really shines to your values. You said that one of the things that you're proud of is that you stay true to your values. And I think the top tips that you're giving us for your COVID experience, Rupa, really show this true through and through. There's always a twinkle in the Rupa conversation with your <laughs> sense of humor, I must say. And I think there are a couple of things that, you know, if, if we're really thinking about the bright side of all of this, um, we're, we're all having to just be a little bit more patient about some of the things that we normally can do without thinking. And um, we have to balance that off with the trade for our health and the health of our, those that we love. This is the way I've got my head around it because I'm quite an impatient person. And this idea of team is so important. Um, you know, my team at FIP headquarters are stand shoulder to shoulder. It's amazing to have their support, but we also work with all our member organizations and all our volunteers and people need to, you need to be in touch with them. So that takes a bit more effort, Rupa. And I think when we're, when we're through this, however long that takes, um, maybe we need to apply those same principles about humor, resilience, and, you know, the 14 to 16 hour days to any kind of new normal that emerges, whatever that looks like, because I think it does make us better people if we just apply a bit of patience to some of the things. I must say though, Rupa, that if it hadn't have been for you setting up the Women in Global Health um, with your tribe in 2015, the resonance that you're feeling right now, the way in which you can make sure that the Women in Global Health um, points that need to be made, still need to be made, which are a pity, but we know they're a truth. I don't think the environment would have been quite so receptive, even with COVID-19. So I think, you know, there's something about you finding those opportunities because of the work you've done along the way. And I think that's a real reflection for you to take on the chin and to really note that that work of leadership that you've done, you mentioned that you were building on those that had gone before. Well, if you didn't do it then, we wouldn't be where we are now. And that really has inspired me. And I think that you really, you really are a testament to when you look back at um, Rupert as a child who, who, who was seeing <laughs> your parents face adversities. You really, really built on that and really demonstrated that in the work that you do, Rupert. And my reflection for you is that um, we're really proud of you. I know that you're in medicine, but you're a woman in global health. And I have to say, the women in pharmacy are really proud of what you do and what you stand for. And we stand shoulder to shoulder with you, Rupa. Oh, thank you, Catherine, so much. It's, it's such, a, such a privilege to have been able to join you this morning and, uh, or your afternoon and uh, just, yeah, talk, talk with you. And I really feel so much solidarity from the women in, in pharmacy, but I'd say just even the community of FIP over the past few years. So this is really great that you guys are organizing these um, these chats, I, I feel like uh, lessons learned are, are just so valuable and just to have these really frank conversations. So thanks for bearing with me today. And, uh, and I uh, hope, uh, I hope that, you know, I was able to share some, some key lessons.
You have, you have, Rupa, definitely. And you have, you've shared them with us, not just the women in our profession, but the men too, because they are our allies and our rocks as well. Rupa, it's been such a pleasure and an honour to take you away from your busy life for a short period of time. And I thank you so much. Thanks a million, Rupa. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot, Catherine. Thank you.